So we want to protect them, and that does take away their dignity. There is risk in living. Life is a risk. And if we want to take away all risk, we're taking away their joy of life. And if we take away their dignity, uh, what's left? Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and inspiring guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and fellow Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion online course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. And now, as a thank you to my podcast listeners, I'm offering a $20 off coupon for a limited time. Just use the code PODCAST2018, all caps, at checkout. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me and my coffee in my hand, so let's begin. Carol Bradley Bursack is an expert on caregiving and elder support. She's the author of Minding Our Elders, which she calls a portable support group for caregivers. Her popular column, Minding Our Elders, has been running for 12 years. She's contributed to many other caregiving and dementia support books and is working on her second solo book. And Carol's been interviewed on national radio shows, including NPR's Talk of the Nation, and has been quoted in national media outlets, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Nicole. I'm so happy to be here. You've been doing this a really long time. Um, And I'm wondering, what got you started down the road in uh, learning about being a caregiver to elders? (laughs) That's a pretty easy one. Um, It first started when my neighbor, who I didn't know real well, but he was 100% deaf and in his um, 80s, at the time early 80s, and uh, his wife died. And my kids were still young, but it was one of these things where you just, how can you not help? You know, you, you, I asked him if he needed groceries, that kind of thing. That evolved into five years of basically being uh, Joe's caregiver because uh, I would write, he would talk, we, we just learned how to communicate, and I cared for him until he died. And uh, my kids were part of it, so it's, it's really part of our history. And then shortly after that, my aunt and uncle moved to, um, our area from out in Arlington, Virginia, because they had no children, and they were older than my parents. So then I had parents, in-laws, and aunt and uncle, six. And Mm. gradually, people had health issues, there were deaths, I'll I'll cut this a little bit short, but my dad had brain surgery. Um, He'd had a World War II brain injury, and uh, he'd done very well after he learned to walk and talk again, and lived a good life, Uh, but this, there was fluid building up behind the scar tissue in his brain in the 70s, and um, they were going to relieve that by putting in a shunt, which is quite, quite successful and, and done frequently. Only something went wrong, and he came out of it with major dementia, just overnight. We had no warning. We had nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, there was almost no information for caregivers on dementia. Little was known along about Alzheimer's. This was not Alzheimer's, but... It's a type of dementia, Alzheimer's is. And I had to learn on my own. And uh, what I did instinctively was jump into Dad's world mm-hmm. because he was in a whole different world. And I had doctors who at that time were telling me, no, no, you have to bring him back to our reality. That was called reorientation. Um, I listened to them, and as soon as they left, I did it my way. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually that became not because of me but because of of uh, learning um, on the part of therapists and people who worked with people with dementia, what they call validation. 
And now that is totally the way people work with someone with dementia or Alzheimer's is we need to go into their world. But all these 10 years with dad and then the other elders, one by one, kind of like dominoes, needing help. Um, and I couldn't find anything online. There really wasn't much support. There wasn't support for family caregivers. Doctors didn't like us much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so my book was a catharsis, and that began um, because I needed it, and I felt others did too. And then eventually my newspaper column, because I worked at a, as a librarian at a newspaper, and it just grew. You know, I read the chapter that um, people can download on your website, Minding Our Elders, about your dad. And I was so touched by how tuned in you were um, with his needs. And some of them were nonsensical. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. There was something about mm -hmm. an elephant and something mm -hmm. about and and you being right there with him. Yes, of course, we're going to and you were taking notes. Got to figure out how to get him this or, or, or get him a piece of paper or certificate or a letter. How do I get him what he thinks he needs? And it was very uh, it, it's just it, it puts you right there. It, there's a sense of immediacy as you read that chapter. Uh, thank you. I, I do get a lot of comments on that because Dad's is probably the most dramatic story, and he's on the cover of the book. Um, and as I said, that was probably the real impetus behind the book, even though the others, uh, you know, the sheer volume of elders who needed me um, was also a great part of it. But... But with Dad, for some reason, I just knew. Um, my analogy is you don't tell somebody who broke their leg, well, get up and walk, and then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason, when it comes to brain issues, people just, you know, pull up your socks and do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, this man came out of surgery with a broken brain. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just instinctive for me. And uh, I hear people say, uh, in all my years of, of uh, moderating, uh, moderating um uh, forums on elder care and the questions I get and people will sometimes say I don't I was taught not to lie to my parents mm -hmm. and um, because with that I'd say um, oh yes we'll get a, a elephant for the new zoo which happens to be a small animal zoo and there's no way I could get one but he <laughs> wanted to he wanted to help the zoo and he thought they needed an elephant and um, I could say that I wasn't lying not in my mind. I was being with Dad, and we were living in his world. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people can, you know, you can go black and white. You can say, yeah, but you're still lying. Well, now, you know, go to real experts, the, the doctors, the psychiatrists, and ask them what they think uh, because they will agree with what I did. And that is that the you're punishing somebody with dementia if you keep trying to make them do what they cannot do. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have the brain that works, and their brain still works too. Only it's <laughs> it's on a whole different level. Mm -hmm. And it's almost cruel to ask them to do that. Oh, it truly, truly is. Mm -hmm. People ask about you know when someone dies, and which often happens during a long. Um, when you're caring for someone with dementia, and they can have a brother or sister die, a parent die, or even a spouse. And they'll say, what do I do? I keep telling them, and they break down, and they're crying, and they're, you know, it's just horrible, but I have to keep retelling them because they don't remember. And um, this is what's happening is we, we have to learn ways to mitigate the pain that they're in. And in those cases, it um, depends on the person. It depends on who died. It depends on all kinds of things because everyone's different. But generally, you'll say something like, like, uh, they'll be with you soon. They had to go do something. We'll be together soon or whatever that makes them feel better. But you just don't say, Dad, I told you he died yesterday, you know, or he died last yeah. week. You know, I told you before he died. All you're doing yeah. is like twisting a knife. And yeah. people mean well. I'm not being critical, but you do have to get educated in that. It seems to me that, you know, I'm sure you know so much about burnout, but maybe there's 
something about is it, does it feel like it's more work to say yes I read uh, I read something online about a woman um, and maybe you know this person but uh, her her dad kept saying where's my medical degree I haven't gotten it in the mail and I've been waiting for it and actually she, that's me oh is that you <laughs> yeah I was reading oh okay that's funny <clears throat> and I love that story about um, I think that's actually how I found you as I read that story and I thought I want to I, I want to talk to this woman but I love that story about where's my medical degree where's my and then you actually made one for him on the computer and I, it's more work I would imagine to try to um, satisfy some of these requests which are sometimes a little out there than when people are burnt out and tired and might just say dad you're not a doctor end of story I'm tired well you're right in a way except that I'll tell you it gets very very draining to keep going over the same territory again and watching their pain mm. and when you can do something uh, my dad started working going to medical school before the war World War II I and, see so it made um, sense yeah the war interrupted it then he had the brain injury and whatever, and eventually he went back to college. I, I was 14 when I went to his graduation, and he was in public health. But he never became a doctor. But once this dementia came, obviously way deep down somewhere, um, he'd wanted, he felt that he'd earned that degree. And um, I did try a couple times explaining what happened, um, but it, it didn't, it's not what he wanted. It's not what he wanted to hear. Uh, he didn't have the memory issues of, of Alzheimer's, but it wasn't what he wanted to hear. He really felt he'd earned it. And my only thought was, well, then he's going to get a degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made him one. And uh, what's really funny is, is years later, a psychiatrist who'd pop his head in the door once a month at the nursing home um, happened to have the head nurse who became a real good friend of mine. Um, with him, and he was looking at Dad's wall, which was covered not only with his real certificates and things, but with his certificate from Lawrence Welk for helping direct his band, that's another story, <laughs> and um, all kinds of things, including his medical degree. And he said to Sarita, I didn't know he was a doctor. <gasps> and Sarita just smirked, and she looked at him, and then she pointed at me. Mm -hmm. and, and then he nodded, and he got it. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, I could have a second career here if it weren't illegal. <laughs> 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 but um, anyway, that's a uh, great. That's a. I love that story. Um, you know, we were talking before we went on about how it's very complicated. Caretaking of our loved ones, of our elders, is very complicated. And of course, we all know that it can be draining and tiring and drain our resources in many ways. But one of the things that I find my clients struggle with is if they've had um, a painful relationship with their parents or elders when um, before the illness uh, or dementia or, you know, uh, set in. And so there's a lot of ambivalence. There's, I love you, I'm here to take care of you, but... We've had a pretty tough past, and I still have some wounds from that. Could you talk a little bit about how, how to navigate that, that tricky relationship? This is a common question, Nicole, that I get um, for my column, but as also as a moderator for, for a forum, is, um, you know, we love the idea that there's all these happy, perfect families, but reality, as you well know as a therapist, um, is that most of them are more in the middle. And many of them have had types of abuse, some far worse than others. Sometimes it's verbal, sometimes physical, mixture, sexual abuse, and everything. And there are caregivers who write to me and they say, I feel I'm an only child, or I'm the oldest child, or the only one here. I feel this need to take care of my parent now who is ill. And um, this may or may not be dementia. It, it just whatever is, is wrong with the person. But the verbal abuse hasn't gone away. And I don't know how much I can take. Um, or even if it's gone away, there are all these emotional scars. And uh, I just don't know how much I can do. 
And what I do, because caregiver guilt is huge, even when you do everything you possibly think you can do right, you're going to blame yourself for everything. Mm -hmm. It just goes mm -hmm. with the territory. Mm -hmm. And so these unfortunate people have that extra load. And I always tell them, do what you can, but you have to respect yourself, too. And respect your past and respect your pain. And um, as I, we, when we were talking earlier, I said, I'm not a therapist. I'm not trying to be a therapist, but I, I have common sense. And I've known a lot of caregivers. And what I do with them is, even in a healthy relationship, burnout is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. you just get so, so tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the relationship isn't healthy, uh, then you, you really need to pull back more and depend on other people, hired care, whatever. And if it's a really difficult situation, very bad, especially if the person is afraid that this relationship is going to bring out an abusiveness in their relationship from their side mm -hmm. because their parent is now weakened um, and uh, they're in the strength, you know, they're in the seat of strength uh, and they're, they're, they don't want this and they're terrified. And I generally tell them then even, you know, there is nothing wrong with getting hired help in home. Um, certainly nothing wrong with, with assisted uh, living or nursing home care if you need to. You can still be a caregiver. You can be the advocate. Mm -hmm. But you might need someone else to do the hands-on care. Mm -hmm. And this other person is likely to not be abused as much or else they have the distance of not being a family member so they don't have that history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such good advice and you know can you take us through for our listeners just to really have almost a little checklist how do we know when we're getting burnt out because I think that there's a day-to-dayness about it you know you might have to feed your elder you might have to help them uh, with a toilet you might have to do all these things and I think people kind of get in a routine and almost kind of get uh, sort of maybe detached or numb um, it's just their daily, you know, reality. How do we know when we're getting to the point of burnout? It's, um, that's a really good question. And generally, for most of us, it's a sneak-up thing. Um, I, when my heaviest caregiving time, I had young children, one of, who has, uh, he, one of whom has many health issues. And um, I had five elders in different, three different places. And my days consisted of driving around in this, this square. Um, I used to call it kind of a spider web because I'd be going back and forth and back and forth, you know, getting this person in the shower, getting groceries for that person, making this other person lunch in a different place, going to the nursing home, seeing various people, going back. And you're right. It became routine. You put one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. They need me. We always feel inside I'm the one they need because, um, well, they expect us. And many of us, and I, <laughs> I really did this, we, we can really spoil them with our personal attention. And that's not a bad thing if it's short term, but when it's long term, sometimes we have to back off a little bit. But the feeling of, I don't know how long I can do this. Mm -hmm. or a feeling of a creeping anger when you have to, or overeating, um, mm -hmm. and other stress coping things. Uh, obviously, alcohol or drug abuse would fit into that depending on the personality, which tends to be kind of the same as overeating, whatever the drug of choice is. Uh, trying to numb yourself so that you can continue on, mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge sign. And um, not, not uh, taking time to get yourself to your own appointments, uh, you need a mammogram, um, you need your, your yearly exam, you need to see if you've been, say you have depression anyway, you need to see your own therapist. And if you get so tired of sitting in doctor's offices like I did with mm -hmm. all of my elders, there's this tendency to say, I just, I don't need that that badly. And put that aside. And when you start doing that, that is another sign you're reaching burnout. So, and depression, just depression about having to lift up your feet and do it again. It's so heavy. Heavy. And then resentment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's tough to be a, 
a good caregiver when you feel heavy resentment. You're going to feel it from day to day. Don't expect perfection of yourself because none of us are going to get there. But if you're feeling resentment a lot, uh, it is time to get help for your caregiving so that you don't get over the stage of caregiver burnout and into what they call caregiver uh, compassion fatigue, which you would know about, Nicole, mm-hmm. and, and uh, that gets very serious. So the idea is catch yourself, maybe ask your spouse or ask, see a therapist, um, ask someone what they think when you tell them how you feel, someone you can trust, not somebody who's being judgmental about how you're being a caregiver. Mm-hmm. And uh, they can probably help you find your way. But mainly it is if you are neglecting self-care totally mm-hmm. and you're feeling resentment and you just can hardly go through the motions anymore, you are dangerously close to burnout. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's so tricky because we like to see ourselves, especially people who are caretakers um, and who may be natural caretakers, we like to consider ourselves to be empathic and compassionate and loving. And I know this happens in the medical field. When we get numb and burnt out, we lose our ability to care anymore. And that can be really frightening for people like, who have I become? That's excellent, and it's. uh, I was just thinking as you were talking, perhaps uh, some of us would be better off if we didn't have so much empathy, didn't want to do it as badly, um, and yet we are the people who step forward. But uh, many of us have trouble stepping back and getting help, and uh, the people who maybe aren't as naturally a caregiving personality uh, probably wouldn't burn out as quickly because they'd be more willing to, oh, say, not say, mom wants it this way, and I will do it this way, so this is what has to be done for Mm -hmm. the minor things, they would think, okay, we, I'll do my very best, but I'm going to get help, uh, at a little earlier stage. So it's, it's, um, it's difficult. And I think the more uh, empathy that you have, it can, it can lead overboard. Like you say in the medical profession, if you take on every person or you as a therapist took on every person's problems to mm-hmm. the degree that it affected you, you couldn't carry on with your job. And to a large extent, it's the same way with a caregiver. So you have to learn to detach. Even though it's hard, you have to get to a point where you say, no, my mother is being cared for by some really good people mm-hmm. in a nursing home. They aren't going to do things exactly as I do them. She's not going to be 100%. Um, pleased, but maybe I need a day off. And I'll say this, the head nurse finally told me one day when my mother was getting very difficult, and she did not have Alzheimer's. She was getting really difficult, and Sarita said, you know, just don't come tomorrow, Carol. And it's like, oh, I never thought of that. I mean, they're two blocks away. (laughs) Yeah, they're two blocks away from my house, and they call if there was a problem. And I didn't go that day. Um, It was the only day I'd done that, and I did let my mom know. But you know, when I went back the day after, she was a lot better. Hmm. So now with Alzheimer's or dementia, this can be different. I'm not mm-hmm. not comparing them. She had uh, memory issues, but that was due to something else. And um, she did not have Alzheimer's by any means. When they have se- severe memory issues, that kind of thing, um, they may not remember. But you still need to say, I can't come tomorrow so-and-so will be here to take care of you, leave a note, perhaps, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that the person caring for him can say, you know, Sally can't come today, but she is doing this, and she'll be in touch with us, so if you really need her, she can be here, and um, just, you know, take the day for yourself, and it's a very, Mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a hard lesson to learn, but it is. You know, I'm thinking about how many levels of complexity there are here. So we're talking about the relationship, kind of navigating this caretaking relationship to do it in a way that is satisfying for you, but also doesn't burn you out. But I'm also thinking of the other challenges um, uh, 
being a caretaker, and I'm thinking about now we have to start thinking about the financial aspects of, okay, mom needs to be in a nursing home. What does that mean? You know, I've heard my clients talk about Medicaid refusal um, or Medicare refusal and, you know, just this whole thing about, you know, can I afford to retire now? Mom needs more care. Um, and so there's that. But also, you know, I think about the sort of the medical field and how um, splintered it is. So you're going here for ortho, here for diabetes, here all over. It seems like there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle that do not run smoothly. Does that make sense? <laughs> Unfortunately, it entirely makes sense. Uh, it depends a great deal on where you live. Um, that's unfortunate, but some states have much more um, in place to help caregivers. When I first began with all of mine, um, there was practically nothing. I mean, it was just under the radar that families were expected to do this. I was out of the workforce for a while, the, the uh, easy workforce, which means a paying job, and <laughs> caring for all of these people. And um, this is a point I'd like to make, is I lost a lot of future earnings through Social Security and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. These are things caregivers don't think of. We often end up with not a lot for our own retirements because we end up using our own money to help with caregiving. We sometimes work fewer hours or even have to take a leave of absence um, or quit a job just because somebody's, you know, people in our family need care. And um, this is a huge issue. But back to the some of these other issues is that where you live makes a difference. I want to make a point. You mentioned Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare does not cover long-term care. Mm -hmm. um, people get confused about that. Uh, Medicare or long-term care generally, and I'm not an expert on long-term care, but I, I know what it did to our family, is that you pay until the money runs out, basically. You spend down, and then uh, you can go through Medicaid, which is a process. And um, as a caregiver, you want to make sure you take really good notes and you, you keep receipts and pay attention to where the money goes because if you go on Medicaid, there's a five-year look back. And that look back time is they'll see how where the money went before you go on Medicaid. So you can't say, I'm going to spend them down by, um, Grandma always wanted each of my kids to have $10,000, so this is a good time to do it. It's too late. Mm -hmm. and uh, But there are people who have a lot of assets and they, they see... Um, elder care attorneys, and there are more and more of these people now, and I think that there are other ways of doing things. But with my family, it was private pay for seven and a half years. Everything was gone. And um, the last three months, I believe, of my mother's life, she finally was on Medicaid. So that's all that was, <laughs> all that was paid for um, that way. And, but our state did a good job. And some states make it harder, and I do think it's getting worse now. Mm -hmm. There are more cuts. Um, and uh, also, some states are just plain, they, they just don't do a very good job. And uh, some mm -hmm. places, um, you're looking at neglect and abuse because of poor caregiver ratio and that kind of thing uh, in homes. And so where you live, unfortunately, makes a huge difference in the kind of support you get. Mm -hmm. So while you're dealing with this relationship and all the emotional resources that it takes, and you may also be launching your kids, right? So right. you're doing the, the whole sandwich generation of, okay, my kids are still in school, maybe they're in high school, maybe I'm needing to help with that transition. If they're going to college, what does that look like? taking care of the elders, the resources, and then trying to navigate the medical system, which is a complicated right. mess. As yeah. we know in this country, it's just, it's, it, it's a disaster. Yes, it is. And that was part of your last question as well, was that it's, uh, 
the going to all of these doctor appointments and uh, all of the things that they need and deciding things like uh, I could tell my mom was probably developing colon cancer and uh, she at that point her brain was working fine and I said what do you want to do and the doctor suggests a colonoscopy and she said I know I can't take the surgery for a cure so what's the point and mm-hmm. I'll say I'll do whatever you want mom but you know for her she did the right thing um, so we were going for doctors for that, and she had a hip replacement, and she had a number of things, and of course my dad's brain surgery, my uncle's strokes, all of these things. Um, my dad had skin cancer that we weren't worried about cosmetic issues, but there were things that we didn't want causing pain. And uh, man, I mean, I used all of my vacation time taking people to doctors, different doctors in different places, even though they were in a nursing home. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was it was a mess. I mean, I made it work, mm-hmm. but it is difficult. And we are, you know, like you say, it's it's scattered all over. And it would be ideal if they had these doctors come um, to make house calls. It would be wonderful. But even mm-hmm. say they're in a nursing home or assisted living, if they could do some of these things there, I mean, what a gift that would be. But I don't see that happening for a while. Mm-hmm. I was just uh, uh, teaching a a class on aging, and one of the students uh, works in a nursing home and talked about something I had never heard of, although I'm sure you know a lot about it. She talked about this thing she called dignity risk, where this idea is we know that some of these um, people are living in the community, and they're in a vulnerable state, but it's so important for them to live still independently that it's worth that risk. Um, can you speak to that? The whole, Absolutely. Yeah, the whole, the, this whole idea of like, how do you figure out when it's time to say you can no longer live independently, even though I know it's going to be very difficult? A lot of that depends on, on if there's cognitive impairment of dementia of some kind. My personal feeling is that if the person's brain is working well, there's no reason why they can't make their own decision. Um, I have met, used the term wrapping them in bubble wrap too often, but we don't want to see our parents get hurt, and we see them maybe getting more frail. And so it's like, you know, oh, Dad, you shouldn't be out in the shop. And mom, you shouldn't be gardening. And what if you fall? And what if you do this? And and so we want to protect them. And that does take away their dignity. There is risk in living. Life is a risk. And if we want to take away all risk, we're taking away their joy of life. And if we take away their dignity, uh, what's left? Mm-hmm. And these are these are our parents or our elders or a spouse or someone who is a whole person but their body is is, uh, betraying them or their mind is betraying them. So to me, as long as the person can think reasonably well, and this might mean you need some, uh, like a personal alarm, they'll maybe make a compromise with you on, now with technology, there's so many sensors. There are many things that can be done around the house where they can have, everyone can have some sense of safety. You know, you could maybe, uh, even from your smartphone, keep track if you sent something up with the proper sensors. There's tons of stuff available. However, they are left with the dignity of living on their own because that is their choice. Mm-hmm. Now, some older people or people with illnesses feel safer in a, a good assisted living or somewhere where they're in a community, and that's perfectly fine. It depends on the person. But dignity is to me, more important in many instances than perfect health or anything else. Mm -hmm. And I do feel that elders should be, you know, they're people, they're human beings. They need to be able to make their own decisions. Now, when you start getting into the really advanced stages of dementia, you may need to have someone come in the home, someone live with them, or eventually sometimes you just have no choice um, but to to move them to a memory unit simply because it's so incredibly risky, uh, burning the house down, things of that nature, that um, 
even for other people, just like taking away the car keys, which is the worst, <laughs> or one of the worst things to do when it comes to dignity. Um, but you can't have somebody driving who can run over the neighborhood kids without even knowing it. So some things, sometimes you do have to step in and be the bad guy, and, and it's really, really tough. But when you can, even if it's a little bit of a risk for your elder, go mm -hmm. for it. They need that. You know, I'm thinking of a client whose mom does not want to take insulin um, oh. anymore, and um, she's very clear. She's, you know, she doesn't like the needles and all this, but it's so difficult, I think, to decide can she truly comprehend what the consequences will be if she does not take insulin, and that's where it gets so difficult, I think, you don't really know if, you know, depending on, of course, the cognitive level of impairment, but if generally things are pretty good, how do you honor their, you know, personhood and say, okay, you know, if you don't want to do the insulin anymore, you don't have to, knowing that that's going to be a medical crisis, I think diabetes is one of the most difficult things to work with because, uh, again, you've got the insulin, but then if they have their insulin and don't eat, you've got a problem. Well, often they don't want to eat. I've seen a little bit of this, so I didn't have to deal with it. So I really, really feel sorry for people in that situation. But overall, my feeling is that sometimes people just plain get tired. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their right, too. And, I mean, I think they need all the cooperation, they need all the support, they need all the choices, um, options. In this case, if the cognitive um, functioning is still good, I could see making a pro and con list, printing it out, and um, just saying, please keep taking your insulin for a few days while you comprehend this, and then we'll talk about it again. Uh, maybe see a therapist together and decide what it is, you know, that you truly want to do because you are probably not going to live if you quit taking mm -hmm. your insulin. But well. in the end, there is a certain amount of choice. And I have to say that they're going to do what they're going to do, too. If, if you are not with that person 24 hours a day and you say, did you take your insulin? And they're tired of being nagged. They're likely to say, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And so it's better to work with them and have some honest um, feeling about what's going on than it is to just make them angry so they dig their feel, heels in and uh, work against you. Yeah. It's just difficult. Well, there are yeah. so many difficult decisions to make. And none of us, you know, there's just, it's gray area. None of it's black and white. Mm -hmm. um, the insulin thing, again, I would definitely talk with a doctor, see if there are options other than the insulin or some way without the needles that could at least help in some issues. But um, it's just, there's just so much gray area that it, it's, um, it's, that's why, it's, that's uh, you know, it. caregivers yeah. can use, use a therapist themselves, believe me. Oh, I'm, I am, I can see that with my own clients. And, you know, who are we to say uh, that our elders should be prolonging their life. If, exactly. If, you know, who are we to say? Is it for us or is it for them? I have a little story there that I'll have when the nursing home where I was every day for 15 years for different people, I naturally got to know the staff very well. And sometimes I could t read their their visual signs, even though they didn't cross the line in, in um, telling me about other people. But uh, one day I walked by, I was going to know my dad's room and the man across the street I could hear this rasping and this horrible labored breathing and everything and um, I talked to the nurse and I said what you know what's happening and she said he was dying last night and he was in the 90s and she said the family said no we're going to wait until God takes him and they insisted on a tracheotomy mm -hmm. and, a, and a ventilator and so there he was struggling, making these horrible sounds. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was for them, not mm -hmm. for their dad, who'd lived a long life 
and was dying in a natural manner. Uh, they couldn't let go for whatever reason, and I'm trying not to judge that, but to me, I guess I'm judging it if I say that was selfish, because to me it was. We have to look at whether we're doing it for ourselves. I mean, your question was so wonderful because we have to look at whether we're doing it for ourselves or for them. And they do have a right to decide how badly they want to struggle to continue to breathe if their quality of life is going downhill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult. And I'm just going to guess that because you have been steeped in this for so long, uh, these experiences have influenced your own choices in terms of your health care directives. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. My... Um, I was writing in my column all the time about how important it is to get all of the uh, legal documents in line, and I had never done it. And finally I thought, <laughs> what a hypocrite. Um, so I made myself do it. And, um, you know, my kids were the ones who were uncomfortable with it because it's like, we don't want to think about mom dying. Right. She's healthy. She's running around here. You know, we can't imagine that. And I told them, you know, this is, we're going to get these things signed, and then we can get on with the business of life and forget about it. But I have to say, and sometimes I think we get tired of hearing it, um, they're over on Sundays a lot. And, you know, because of what I do, I tend to speak of life and death the same breath as what are we going to have for supper. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sometimes they roll their eyes. They're kind of like, Mom. Um, in fact, I've been known to have Alzheimer's pop out of my mouth when I'm using another word that starts with A, just because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what I do for many hours every day, seven days a week. But um, my kids know, and I've got it written down, but I remind them until they're sick of hearing it, I don't want that. When my brain is goes, if I am not me, this is my choice. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I can handle, you know, say a hip replacement. I can handle physical pain. I can handle a lot of things. But if my brain goes, because my, my joy in life to relax to whatever is reading, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I saw my dad, through no choice of his own, rendered in, he was the same way. He couldn't read because his brain was damaged by the surgery, and of course he had no choice. Dad would never have chosen those last years, years of his life, but he had no choice because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm only too aware it could happen to me. But if there is a way to say, just let me live my life till I'm gone, rather than prolonging it, do it. And mm -hmm. I feel strongly, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm uh, not one of these people who's uh, got a real strong personality and mom wants this and that, but they know there's one thing I feel strongly about, and that is do not extend my life beyond what is natural, and let me decide if I have... Um, some, if I can, you know, some way of, of um, if this is going to prolong my life, or I choose not to have surgery, chemo, and, and all of the rest because I'm 85 and have breast cancer. That's my choice, not theirs. Mm -hmm. You know, I've uh, just been thinking so much about this lately because I've been interviewing different people who work in, in different aspects of this. In fact, um, I just interviewed Alua Arthur, who's a death doula, and she talks, ah. you know, that's her job. She goes in and she she sort of helps the person and the family um, plan their death. And it sounds dark, but my experience getting the Five Wishes document was that it was strangely liberating. And it's mm. hard to describe because it's so strange and weird. But when I wrote out what I wanted, what I wanted my, you know, how my body to, you know, be taken care of, who I wanted there, what it would look like, and all of this. And it had, like, my stamp all over it, you know, having right. to do something with the woods and my dogs and my friends, my husband, all this stuff. There was a way that it was like a relief, and now I could really focus on, and I'm alive, and I'm going to make the very most of it. 
Did you have that experience? Oh, absolutely. Um, it wasn't even so much the actual signing of the papers and all of that. It's just because of I've um, attended many deaths myself, and we've had hospice care for both my parents, which was they were just so amazing. You know, I loved working with them, and they were just. Um, it was great. And I have noticed, by the way, death doulas are becoming, I mean, maybe they've been around for decades, I don't know, but I know that it's becoming kind of a new, more high profile thing. And it sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. Because um, the process of dying, our culture has made death a taboo to talk about. And that's so sad. Because death is part of the life cycle, and it's going to happen. And when I was holding my dad, uh, when he took his last breath, I, I, I felt the spirit leave his body. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. Mm. And when my uncle died, um, it was, I was sitting with him, and uh, it was so peaceful. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful experience. And so I, I've learned, um, I don't know how afraid, you know, when you, I think when you get older, through the years, you become less afraid of death, most people. Maybe we are more realistic. Maybe we've witnessed more death. Um, pain, yeah, most of us don't want that. Mm -hmm. But the actual death process, we become more at peace with it. But I do think um, doing what you said and the five wishes is a wonderful way to go. Uh, filling out the forms, thinking about it. Yeah, this is part of my life, and I get these choices. If, if I'm given a choice in how I die... Uh, don't have a stroke or an accident or something um, that uh, kills me. I have told them what I want, and uh, this is what I want, and it's I've accepted this is part of my life. And so uh, I just think really looking at it, learning and absorbing the fact that death is part of the life cycle. We're all going to die, so we may as well absorb the fact that uh, we can have some input in, in how we do it if we're fortunate. And the gift that that really gives our loved ones. Oh. So when they're, if they're in the hospital with us or if we're ill, they don't have to also then say, well, does she want this or should we do this or we right. don't know. And the doctors are really about let's do everything we can to keep this person alive and that may be running counter to what what the patient wants or what the family wants i um <laughs> this brought to mind a book that actually i'll recommend it to you and i almost never do this but uh, dr kevin hasselhorst uh, wrote wishes to die for mm. and um i actually wrote the uh, prologue to his book but I mean the forward to his book, but um, that was a few years back. But he he really delves into um, this idea where um, there is peace and um, in death, a natural death, and that our previous look, doctors are, are taught in school, save that life, save that life, save that life. And he, he's, he's an ER doctor. And he had an epiphany at one point, and he tells a wonderful story about that. When he, all of a sudden, he thought, what am I doing to this man? This isn't what he wants. And um, he actually had designed a bracelet now where people can, uh, they get to a point in life where they may or may not um, be living a lot longer, where they can turn it over one way or another if they uh, want to be resuscitated or not. Oh, my um, goodness. But anyway, he talks in depth about this, and many others do. This is just one that came to mind because I was involved with it, mm -hmm. and he's, he's a great guy. But um, the point is that I think the whole medical profession, especially the younger doctors, are starting to get it. They're starting to realize that we have been torturing some of our older people, mm -hmm. trying to make them breathe longer. Um, so we can say they're living longer when their quality of life is so, so bad and it's not what they would choose. And I do see a slow change in uh, medical views where you don't have to fight tooth and nail with a doctor um, if someone is at that point. They're more likely to listen to you and say, okay, especially with a, 
um, an older person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, as the demographics are really shifting, we're going to have to get a lot better. Um, at at caring for our elders and and caring for ourselves and and taking perhaps a different view of dying because it's going to be uh, something that's just right in front of us much more as our population ages. I'm hoping that uh, people will open their eyes to some degree, and and many people are. I find a lot of my articles on this are read a lot, Um, and I'm only giving my personal opinion, but I think very slowly, uh, it's not always easy to accept a death, and I mean, I I have people on some of the Facebook groups (laughs) that I'm in, some of the private groups, my mother's 95 and I'm not ready to lose her, and I understand that, Mm -hmm. I truly do, Mm -hmm. however, this is about your mother, and um, you know, we, we are going to have to come to, to grips with that, mm-hmm. that it's about them and their quality of life. It's not about our lifespan. It's about our health span. And most of us would not choose on our own to live in pain and misery mm-hmm. for what can be years uh, beyond what our body really had in mind. Right, right. Boy, this is such a complex subject, and I think, you know, and then dealing with siblings who may have different right. ideas <laughs> or different religious beliefs about mm-hmm. saying, you know, mom wanted this, and that means no more treatment, no more resuscitation. But your sibling may have a very different view of this, and then how do you negotiate that um, very difficult, very difficult, and we would love to think that caregiving brings families together and everybody becomes this wonderful, happy group, but I was fortunate. I mean, I have two siblings, a sister and a brother, and I didn't run into any issues. Uh, we we worked together well enough that this was not a problem, but in many families, uh, especially if there are any sibling issues to begin with that are mm-hmm. kind of tricky, mm-hmm. um, then you you run into problems. And um, as you say, if you've got two people, two siblings, um, really, really at odds about what it looks like to die or should look like and uh, what we accept as the time to die, it can be very stressful for everyone. The first thing I'll say is if people are going to argue about this, please do not do it in front of your parent. Mm. I mean, they do not need to hear the siblings arguing. Uh, take it elsewhere. But this is why it's so important to get our wishes down, because the, the person who says, Mom said she did not want any more after this point, does have a little more weight then. Mm-hmm. And the other person can say, but to me a natural death is, and you can go through this. And in that case, I would suggest seeing, talking with the doctor, and laying it all on the table and listening to what the doctor says about what your, let's say it's your mother, what she would go through if she, if you do these procedures right. and what she would feel and, or if you let her go and um, followed what she maybe wrote down in her, her legal papers. So, um, but it is, it's very hard and some, some families end up not speaking for the rest of their lives. Oh, I mean, it can get gosh. to be that bad. But generally speaking, it, you know, that's an extreme. Carol, what's next for you? I know that you are working on your second book, your second solo book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what, what you're working on? Well, a lot of what I do, aside from my newspaper column, is uh, writing for medical websites. Uh, some of, a couple of them I've written for, for over a decade. And uh, one of them is Health Central dot com and I they just started what they call the candid caregiver who is and I'm the candid caregiver (laughs) so that's kind of a a, a new thing with them even though I've written for Alzheimer's and caregiving for them for a decade and that's exciting and fun and um, I'm also 
um, taking my column to, it's in 30 different newspapers, but hoping to expand on that. And uh, I just, I, I write. I mean, I work every day on that, and I have also learned how much social networking works into it, which I have to say I didn't willingly go there. Um, I'm not a very social person anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, But I've learned that I can connect and touch uh, a lot of people, and um, they tell me, they ask me um, questions through social media as much as they did anything else. So there's just a lot of things to learn, and I want to keep on learning forever. I learn from my readers. I learn from other writers. I learn from, of course, medical sites. But I want to take all of that and um, just, you know, it's, it's follow where it goes is, is kind of how my life has always worked. I've um, ended up in some pretty strange places doing some unusual things I hadn't planned, and I kind of expect that's going to be the rest of my life. So wherever it goes, it's okay. <laughs> I see. So there's a there's a kind of uh, mystery about it that you're just saying, okay, let's see what's around the next corner. That's right, because I, I firmly believe there are things around the next corner, and I'm not always sure what they're going to be. And <laughs> some of the best things that have happened to me have been things that I've tried to convince people of. I've tried to do this. Nobody listens. And I kind of give up, and then all of a sudden, boom, there, you know, there it is maybe in a little different form than I thought, whatever, right. but it's another path to follow. And I do want to write another book. Um, I was always going to be a novelist. Well, <laughs> uh, I ended up in all of this caregiving venture of all of these decades, purely by accident. It's where life led me. It was, uh, as I was talking to someone one day, and they said, I don't know how you do it. And I said, I didn't choose it, it chose me. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of, I guess, the way I have to look at my life now is not that I don't have any input and preferences and whatever, and I will certainly um, go with that and uh, the things that I enjoy doing, the things I love doing. But really what I love doing, I guess, is, is helping others and um, doing what I can. And a lot of that is saying that's all I can do is listen. I can't give you, I can't give you a solution. I wish I could. But I can listen. And I get a lot of um, gratification from that. So I'll keep doing what I'm doing and then see what else happens. You know, somebody else wants me to write for them. Uh, another opportunity comes by. I'm a freelancer, so that's what I do. Uh, any last words of wisdom for our listeners as we kind of wrap up? Try and take care of yourselves if you're a caregiver. Um, try and enjoy life. And remember self-care. If you're a caregiver, great. If you're not a caregiver, you still need to remember self-care. We live in this crazy world where it's do, 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 do. And I really think that I've always needed time to be. And I've needed more alone time than the average person. I'm aware of that. I um, have to be careful not to become agoraphobic since I work from home. <laughs> right. It's a but, different kind of world. Yeah. yeah, it truly is, but I love it. And, um, but I, I, I feel like we need more time to be. And if that means you like to walk, you like to go jogging, you volunteer, whatever it is, but don't make yourself so busy that you have no time with yourself because the older you get, I believe, the more you can benefit from time of the perspective of age and why your life has unfolded the way it is and how it may continue to unfold. Mm -hmm. So we do need that time to just be. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen on that. Where can people, where's the best place to find you, Carol, for, for our listeners? Where would you send them? MindingOurElders.com. Um, if you go there, there's a link to my blog, which is Minding Our Elders Blogs with an S dot com, that posts something new every day. And um, I'm on Facebook under Minding Our Elders. That's really my my other name. Okay. <laughs> and so you know, you type Minding Our Elders into your search engine, you're going to find me. But yeah. Minding Our Elders dot com will take you to my main website, which will take you to my column. It will take you to um, other things that I've written. Um, 
it, it just takes you everywhere. And so that's really the anchor. I have really appreciated hearing all of the ways, all of the ways caregiving can be gratifying, but also very difficult and complicated. And I really think our listeners are going to benefit from hearing your expertise because I think most people just feel lost. And, right. Um, I really and especially when they begin. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, and so you, you know, you provide so many resources for them. And I've, in this sense, like, I've been here before, and I can anticipate what's going to be tough. It's just, I think it's so important for what might be one of the hardest jobs in the world. It truly is. And, and this is what I hear from people, and it's, this is maybe why I keep doing what I'm doing, is that they tell me, I know you've been there, not the exact spot, because none of us have the exact same life, but you've been there and you get it. And, uh, you know, people can have a lot of training and a lot of education and be terrific, and this includes neurologists and all your doctors, and we need them desperately. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes we just need to talk to another caregiver. And I, that's kind of the role I feel for a lot of people now, is that other caregiver who's not going to judge them and might even have a little useful advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's been delightful. Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. I love to hear from my listeners, so send me an email at NicoleChristina.com and tell me what you'd like to hear more about. I would also greatly appreciate if you could hop on iTunes and rate the show. Ratings help other people find the podcast so I can share all these good, juicy interviews with others. I would also invite you to become a patron of the Zestful Aging podcast. Hop on over to patreon.com forward slash zestful aging and consider making a small donation. You will be eligible for insider only goodies and behind the scenes information. And it'll help you feel good knowing that you're contributing to the zestful aging podcast. I'll look forward to sharing more juicy interviews next week on zestful aging.